Hello and welcome. I'm Diane Lavinia, Director of Industry Relations for the IDSA Foundation. To kick off CDF Awareness Month, we're pleased to present the next webinar in our Dr. John G. Bartlett Memorial Education Series entitled The Burden of CDF. This webinar is made possible by the support of our industry partners, Amune Therapeutics and Series Therapeutics. I would also like to note that the Bartlett Memorial Education Series was founded in November 2021 by Series Therapeutics. Please visit our website, idsafoundation.org, to access prior webinars, sign up for our monthly newsletter, follow us on social media, and stay informed about the mission-critical work of the foundation to reduce the burdens of infectious diseases worldwide. Before I tell you a little bit about our first speaker, I'd like to invite our attendees to enter your questions at any point during the program using the Q&A button. Now let's begin. Dr. Krishna Rao's clinical administrative and research interests include the diagnosis and management of healthcare associated infections, especially C. diff. His clinical work includes managing the University of Michigan fecal microbiota transplantation stool transplant program for recur recurrent C. diff infection, a program that he co-founded. His primary research goal is to investigate how biochemical, microbiological, and clinical factors can help clinical decision-making in healthcare-associated infections. And he hopes to ultimately integrate these factors into robust, robust risk prediction algorithms for use by clinicians. His funding sources have included the NIH, CDC, industry, and nonprofit foundations, and his projects include the study of C. diff infection, the effect of antibiotics on the gut microbiota, and infections from gram-negative bacteria. Dr. Rao? Thanks so much, Diane. Um, I'm honored to be invited to give this talk. Um, uh, and, and Dr. Bartlett, you know, the namesake of this uh, session, uh, casts a large shadow um, as an amazing educator, clinician, mentor, scientist uh, with over 500 publications. Um, my disclosures are here on the slide. I, I've consulted for um, series therapeutics, rebiotics, summit therapeutics, and then um, uh, have a grant from Merck and Company. Um, but my other disclosure is that I'm from the University of Michigan, and I think everyone would recognize the face on the left as Dr. Jo John Bartlett. Uh, the person on the right is uh, the founder of my division of infectious diseases at the University of Michigan, uh, Dr. Bob Feckety. And both Dr. Feckety and Dr. Bartlett were contemporaries um, who both shared an interest in antibiotic-associated diarrhea or pseudomembranous colitis, as the disease was uh, referred to back then. Um, and it was Dr. Bartlett who rightfully is credited with doing some amazing work on uh, establishing Koch's postulates and fulfilling those to, to understand that C. difficile was uh, the cause of this infection. Uh, however, Dr. Feckety also did some work in that vein uh, around the same time in the late 70s. And I won't go through the whole story, but uh, for those of you who are students of history, this is a, a fun story that Dr. Feckety actually published in Lancet 20 years after the original submission where he had a woman, uh, a, a girl that he had as a patient, where he isolated an organism from uh, her case of pseudomembranous colitis, but it was lost in the mail, essentially, only to be found 20 years later in the basement of the CDC. And because this is a spore-forming organism, they were able to get the original sample, grow it out, and identify it as C. difficile. So anyway, you can read the details in the story, but I felt obligated to at least mention Dr. Feckety alongside Dr. Bartlett. I know they were, they were colleagues and knew each other well. Um, uh, but with that, if we can advance the slide, I uh, would like to talk to you today a little bit about the background of C. difficile infection. Uh, we'll spend some time uh, uh, delving into the pathogenesis and life cycle, because I think it informs not only what I'm going to talk about, uh, but also the other talks later today. Uh, and then I'll, I'll focus on the diagnosis for the last part of my talk. Can we advance the slide? All right, so C. difficile infection, as many of you know, it's a gram-positive anaerobic spore-forming bacillus. And each of those uh, aspects of this uh, play into how we think about this disease. It's gram-positive, so that can influence the antibiotics that we might use uh, against it. That's an anaerobe, uh, which makes it difficult to culture um, and work with, and that's actually in part where the name comes from, uh, C. difficile. It's a spore-forming bacillus as well, and that informs its pathogenesis, how, how it spreads. As we just heard about, it can last for 20 years in a sample if stored properly and still be cultivated. 
Um, the syndrome too varies. Uh, some people are asymptomatically colonized with this uh, bacterium. Many people will have a, um, an infection. Sometimes it can be um, self-limited, uh, uh, even if acute. Uh, and that can vary to a fulminant or even dangerous course that can result in death. Uh, next slide. Um, and many of those uh, who remember C. difficile infection in the 80s and 90s, again, during uh, Dr. Bartlett and Dr. Fekete's time period, uh, knew it to be more of a nuisance infection and, and certainly less severe uh, than it has uh, turned out to be. Um, something around uh, uh, the 2000s happened, though, and that something largely was the emergence of this new strain, the epidemic strain, which has different names depending on how it's typed. Uh, I'll just refer to it as ribotype 027 here started off as an outbreak in North America, but then quickly spread to Europe and Asia and then to the rest of the world. Um, so now this strain is, is disseminated worldwide. Uh, and both with this strain and other epidemiologic trends, we've seen this infection grow from a nuisance to a, a horrible disease that um, and still infects hundreds of thousands of people every year, even and then that's in the United States alone. Uh, and even uh, in the more recent numbers, we've seen a decline, um, but still uh, a significant burden of disease. Uh, recurrence is very common. I'll come back to that on the next slide. Um, and uh, that drives the costs to over a uh, billion dollars, uh, again, just for the U.S. alone each year. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, recurrence is one of the things that is, is a real uh, problem in this disease. Um, and it drives costs. Uh, on average, each recurrent patient has multiple stool tests sent for C. difficile and multiple prescriptions for vancomycin. Many require hospitalization to deal with the recurrence and, and pull through. Um, and sometimes surgery is needed as part of that. So the average cost per patient uh, is a staggering $34,000 uh, per case. Um, and this is yet another estimate economically of the burden. Uh, and the, the exact number I, I can't adjudicate not being an economist, but uh, it's still in the billions of dollars every year. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanna spend a little bit of time on this slide talking about the pathogenesis. Um, and like most communicable diseases, this requires two things, right? It requires exposure to the organism, but also susceptibility. And, and here susceptibility is not so much, you know, humoral immunity or the things that we normally think about, but actually um, it seems like the microbiome is central to this. Now the gut microbiome uh, performs many homeostatic functions, um, but one of them is to resist colonization from C. difficile and other potential pathogens. And something can happen to disrupt that microbiome to lose that colonization resistance. Usually that something is antibiotic exposure. Um, and uh, if during that susceptible period, where you no longer can resist colonization, you're exposed to spores, then disease can, uh, can uh, set in and you can have toxin production, outgrowth of vegetative C. difficile, and then symptomatic disease. Um, some people, it turns out, can still clear the infection or be asymptomatically colonized during this time period. It's not exactly understood why that is the case. Uh, but for people who have symptomatic disease who then go on to have um, uh, treatment, many of them will progress from this, this person colored red to this person colored blue. But notice I didn't color them green because uh, uh, many people still will have a recurrence in that setting. And, and some people can have multiple cycles of recurrences before they're finally able to clear this infection. And many require help to do so in the form of microbiota restoration or fecal transplant, as we may hear about later in the talk. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I did want to mention that exposure to spores is something that um, is not really legitimately avoidable for most people in their daily life. Uh, and part of this is, um, while it is a healthcare-associated infection, and we certainly see a lot more C. difficile contamination and exposure in the healthcare setting, these spores are everywhere. Um, uh, it's in public locations. Uh, this uh, work is a, a nice set of studies done by a group out of uh, Houston, uh, Kevin Gary's group in particular, one of our colleagues there, where they just went to places out in the public, park benches, uh, people's homes, chain stores, grocery stores. And essentially, the, the message is wherever they looked, they found it. Um, it's in a quarter of park benches. It's in 30% of retail vegetables, 50% if you're talking about potatoes. So I think it's important to keep in mind that um, it's not unusual for us as people just living our daily lives to come into contact with these spores and potentially be ingesting them and transiting them, even if we don't get colonized um, uh, regularly. Next slide, please. All right, so next I wanna focus on diagnosis, keeping some of those uh, initial points in mind. If we can go to the next slide. So one of the most important things to keep in mind in diagnosing this infection is um, who we should test. Uh, 
And uh, it may seem obvious, but I'm going to make the case that we really should be focusing on symptomatic patients here. Uh, and there's many reasons for that. Uh, what I mean by symptoms, though, is, is primarily diarrhea. And there's a definition that you can operationalize there on the slide of, of more than three loose bowel movements in 24 hours uh, without an alternate explanation. Uh, however, it's definitely the case, especially with more severe disease, especially megacolon, that uh, people can start to slow down their bowel movements, even developing ileus. Um, many of those people actually have more severe disease where they're starting to get colitis. They may have bowel wall thickening visible on imaging. They may progress, progress to pseudomembranes that are visible on endoscopy or even toxic megacolon, which can be life-threatening. Next slide, please. Uh, equally important, though, to know who not to test, and we shouldn't test asymptomatic patients. The reason is um, there's not much to do with that information, um, certainly not in the treatment uh, realm. Um, and many people are colonized, um, infants uh, up to a year of age, um, more than half of them at some point during that first year of life will have detectable C. difficile in their stool, including the same strains that cause disease in, in our hospitalized patients. Um, up to 3% of healthy adults, you can find it. Again, not sure if this is long-term persistent colonization or just transiting. Uh, and then uh, a lot of patients in nursing homes will have this. And really, uh, treatment doesn't decrease the risk of C. diff down the line and doesn't decrease the spread. It may actually worsen the situation. Can we go to the next slide? Um, so I'm showing some animal data here because I think it's a, a really compelling, nice uh, a model of what is taking place, I, I think, in the gut. Uh, but this is a, a well-known phenomenon of increased shedding after vancomycin that dates back to the 90s. Uh, this is an original study I referenced here from Stu Johnson in 1992. Um, but uh, it turns out that actually people who get longer courses of vancomycin versus shorter courses are the ones that actually excrete and shed C. difficile for prolonged periods of time at high levels. Um, so yet another reason that we don't want to treat people unless they actually have the disease. Next slide, please. So again, on, on people who shouldn't be tested, we don't test while on therapy. The reason is it doesn't seem to have any prognostic implications, whether you're, uh, for example, PCR reverts to negative on day two versus day seven. Um, so no point in checking during therapy. Uh, and then immediately following therapy, if patients are doing well and not symptomatic any, any further, then we don't do a test of cure. Um, and again, uh, we know uh, for decades now, we've known for decades now that people can continue to shed spores asymptomatically, even if they never have this disease again and, and, and are cured. Some people could become carriers, um, but regardless, repeat testing for cure and retreatment is not recommended during this period unless you have recurrent symptoms. And many of us as ID consultants and, and uh, our colleagues in GI as well, see patients with recurrent, quote unquote, recurrent C diff. And when you probe this further, they haven't been symptomatic for months. They've actually felt well for months, but they keep getting tested and treated and, and are referred to your clinic for, for recurrent C diff. In that setting, we just stop testing and many of them will do fine and not come back. Uh, next, next slide, please. Um, Post-infectious IBS, I think, is uh, an area of some clinical dilemma, and it can be hard to sort out what's going on here. Um, part of this is it's very common. Uh, about a third of patients may experience some transient uh, IBS-like symptoms after their C. difficile infection. This rarely persists for um, uh, more than a, a month or two as, as a true post-infectious IBS that is, is long-term. Uh, it can be difficult to distinguish from recurrent C. diff, but you usually can figure it out and you usually have some clues that, yeah, this episode that uh, people are describing is uh, way less severe than the original C. diff episode. It may be uh, variable from day to day. It may vary depending on what they eat, um, may have more upper tract uh, symptoms associated with it. The, the types of things we often think about with IBS are often apparent when you probe this a little bit further, but it can be legitimately a tough situation clinically to sort out what's happening. If you do think it's post-infectious IBS, though, I think it is worthwhile to pursue that and not just retest. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and uh, inflammatory bowel disease, I won't spend much time on this, but I think this is a legitimate area of controversy that I don't have a lot of great guidance on how to move forward. Uh, part of this is that the carriage rates are way higher in this population. So uh, when someone is coming in with uh, um, increased bowel movements that are bloody, it's hard to know with a positive test if the C. diff is uh, just there in the carriage state, uh, if the C. diff is actually causing a symptomatic infection. And because C. diff can trigger a flare, both can be happening at the same time. Um, and what do you do with this? And um, this study is uh, from a while ago, uh, a survey of gastroenterologists where they were divided evenly. I can tell you talking with them, they're still uh, divided evenly and, and there's not a clear path forward on this. Um, I think combination therapy, um, there was a study in 2009 that suggested there might be worse outcomes with that that hasn't been borne out subsequently. I think a lot of people are doing some combination therapy, um, but this is an area of true clinical controversy, I think still in the diagnosis realm. Next slide, please. 
this is just to say that there is a differential. I won't go through all of this, um, but I would say that ischemic colitis, um, I bolded for the reason that endoscopically it can have an overlap in presentation with pseudomembranous colitis. But if you get histology, you'll be able to tell the difference. Um, so that's one thing to just be aware of. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an overview of the testing strategies that are out there. Um, and uh, on the top row is nucleic acid testing, which is very analytically sensitive. Um, below that, we have glutamate dehydrogenase testing. Uh, this is a, a, an enzyme, and it's usually an enzyme immunoassay that picks this up. Uh, also very sensitive. Uh, however, unlike the top test, um, this will also be positive in non-toxigenic C. difficile, which don't cause human disease. So we don't do this test on its own. We pair it with uh, a toxin test, either a PCR or the one below, which is another ELISA-based test uh, for the toxins A and B. The clinical specificity, however, varies. Um, and I say low to moderate for the first row because um, this is very likely to pick up a colonization state. Um, and it can be uh, low for the glutamate dehydrogenase, again, because it picks up non-toxigenic strains. And the specificity is good when you pair it with a, a toxin test. However, the toxin test by itself is not very sensitive. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Um, so this kind of summarizes that where the PCR has the advantages of being sensitive and rapid, uh, but it is more likely to pick up carriers, and uh, the inverse is sort of true for the toxin test. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, and so you might ask, well, what about a really sensitive toxin test? If we had that, surely that would rescue us from these diagnostic dilemmas. And distressingly, the answer seems to be no. This is a study um, done where we looked at, uh, where the team looked at carriers versus uh, people who were symptomatic, both of whom were positive by PCR. And if you look at the toxin levels, both in the top panel, which is toxin A, and the bottom panel, which is toxin B, uh, if you look at the, the figures to the right, um, those are all people who didn't have any symptoms for C. difficile. Uh, and you can notice that there's a shockingly large number of patients with very high levels of toxin uh, in their stool that are completely asymptomatic. Uh, next slide, please. So what many of us have come around to, and which I think is actually the strategy going forward, is to combine approaches of di both diagnostic stewardship as well as a testing strategy to really get accurate diagnosis of this infection. And to the right is just what we do at University of Michigan as an example. Um, many centers are now starting to deploy something like this, though, where they're mixing uh, diagnostic stewardship enabled by the electronic health records that many of us have now, along with a, a, a two-step testing strategy. And here at University of Michigan, we're able to probe the EHR even before the order is placed uh, to know if a patient is exposed to laxatives, recent onset of tube feeds or oral contrast, which could cause some loose stools. And it may be uh, uh, that instead of C. difficile. And we found that doing that alone has encouraged a lot of people to reconsider ordering the test. And then we have some additional language about a PCR positive but EIA discordant result, uh, letting people know that they really just need to go back to the patient to figure out what's going on in that setting. Next slide. All right. Um, lastly, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on um, when endoscopy could be helpful. And if there's other things on the differential in particular, this could be a helpful thing to, to do to try to evaluate for that, especially if someone's more severely ill and isn't producing stool because they have an ileus or maybe already have um, uh, something close to megacolon. Um, and again, just to, to mention that get histology if you think it's safe and you're able to do so because the endoscopic appearance can sometimes be mis misleading. Next slide. So this is my last slide. I'll just uh, summarize if you can advance it one bullet at a time, please. Um, go ahead. So yeah, lab testing alone will not make the diagnosis. Um, you do have to take these test results back to the patient, even when you have positive toxin assays, because as we mentioned, that doesn't solve the case for you uh, by itself. Next slide, or next uh, bullet. Um, again, yes, only test eight, uh, symptomatic patients. Uh, please go ahead. Um, don't test for cure and be aware of this post-infectious IBS that happens pretty frequently in many patients. Go ahead. Yeah, repeat testing for cure is not indicated if patients are doing well. Go ahead. And, and endoscopy could help us in certain situations. All right, and with that, I will return uh, uh, back to Diane. Thanks. Great, thank you, Dr. Rao. Our second presenter is Nurja Mehta. Dr. Mehta is a third year infectious diseases fellow at Emory University. She has an interest in the gut microbiome and C. difficile infection. Currently, she's completing her thesis work for a master's in clinical research in which she is evaluating C. diff epidemiology in the Atlanta metro area. Dr. Mehta. Thank you so much. 
I'm going to be speaking about the updated guidelines on the management of Clostridioides difficile infection in adults. Next slide. So I'll specifically be speaking about the update that was published in June 2021. Um, and this was a um, recommendation between IDSA and SHEA um, in terms of updated guidance for C. diff. So the key recommendations, and I kind of want to um, put this in some historical context. So the prior um, guidelines, the complete guidelines were published and they say 2017, but really were published in 2018. Um, and they recommended, for example, on initial C. diff infection, they recommended um, either vancomycin or fidaxomycin. And what you see here and what you kind of are going to see throughout these guidelines is that there's really a pride of place of fidaxomycin kind of being emphasized as our go-to drug of choice. And I'll kind of go through the evidence as to why that may be the case. And so um, just kind of comparing comparing um, the recommendations for initial episode of CDI to the 2017 guidelines, the preference is going to be fidaxomycin for your very first episode. Um, an alternative therapy can be vancomycin given for 10 days. And um, they make the point that if your patient has non-severe severe infection, which they're defining as um, a WBC count of less than 11 or a, and a um, creatinine of less than 1.5, then metronidazole can be considered if it's difficult to acquire um, either oral vancomycin or fidaxomycin. When we look at management of the first recurrence, and um, just to note, um, the IDSA definition of recurrence is going to be between two and eight weeks of the initial episode. Um, the preferred therapy here, again, is fidaxomycin. Um, here they give two different recommendations in terms of dosing. You can um, repeat the 10-day um, course of 200 BID or um, consider doing five days of 200 BID followed by an every other day um, single dose for 20 days. And this data kind of comes from two places. One is a, one clinical trial, which looked at this dosing strategy, as well as some in vitro human gut models um, that demonstrated that the um, half-life is pretty long on um, the fidaxomycin. Um, alternatively, um, the alternative therapy is going to be vancomycin, and this is the first time in the um, recurrent course that they also recommend the use of consideration of the use of bezlituximab. So bezlituximab is a monoclonal antibody that's to be given concurrently with antibiotics, so it's not an alternative. It's something to be given adjunctively with standard of care antibiotics. Next slide. So what happens if your patient has more recurrences? So your patients had their initial episode and then another recur recurrence, and now they're on um, recurrence number two. At this point, the hierarchy goes away. So we no longer have a preferred and alternative agent. Um, so the recommendations for fidaxomycin in either dosing strategy or vancomycin taper. Please note that the recommendation for 10 days of vancomycin is not present here. Um, there are studies that demonstrate that a vanc taper at this point in recurrence course is certainly a better option. Um, you can also consider a combination of vancomycin and rifaximin. Um, rifaximin is a rifamycin that's a pretty broad spectrum antibiotic that has um, poor oral bioavailability, which means it stays in the gut. Um, and so that's a recommendation that we can kind of consider. Um, and then this is also where you, um, in addition to the bezlituximab, which was recommended at episode two or the first recurrence, um, fecal microbiota transplantation can also be um, considered. And so for those of you who may be practicing at centers where this is not as commonly done, um, fecal transplant is basically the practice of taking human fecal matter, which has been um, which has been evaluated for any kind of infectious agent, hopefully, um, and either instilled through enema or colonoscopy or um, instilled through a capsular or an NG tube form um, and has demonstrated some very good efficacy and kind of, I think about it as resetting the gut microbiome and helping with um, clearance of the C. diff. Um, and I'm just going to make one more point to say that bezlituximab should be given concurrently with um, any standard of care antibiotics and FMT should be provided after completion of the antibiotics. Okay, next. So what is fidaxomycin? This is kind of um, a drug that's being um, 
pretty prominently touted in these guidelines. So it's important to understand um, what it is and how it works. So it's a macrocyclic antibiotic. Um, and if anyone can name another macrocyclic antibiotic, I'll be impressed. Um, this is something that is quite specific. Um, and fidaxomycin is kind of the most commonly used macrocyclic antibiotic. Um, it's taken orally and minimally absorbed through the GI tract, which is um, a really positive thing in any drug that we're using for C. diff. Um, note that um, vancomycin, vaximin are also in the same boat in that they don't um, get systemically absorbed, which means that your side effects are going to be a little bit lower, um, which is always positive. Mechanism of action wise, it uh, inhi inhibits bacterial RNA polymerase at the transcription initiation, basically prevents um, the DNA strands from separating. Um, and what makes it, I think, the most attractive um, option is that it's selective. So it's selective against gram-positive spore-forming anaerobes. Um, and because of what Dr. Rao told us about um, the level of dysbiosis that sort of drives um, C. diff and recurrent C. diff, it's important to find a drug that's going to be pretty targeted and, and kind of leave the rest of the gut flora alone. Next slide. So what's the data? You know, these are these are recommendations. They felt compelled to um, publish recommendations a couple of years after the prior. So what are they kind of going off of here? So um, data for the recommendation of fidaxomycin after an initial episode. Um, comes from four different RCTs. Notably, in the 2017 guidelines, they only had access to two of those. Um, and so they have just a little bit more data to kind of bolster um, what they were finding initially. Um, and what's really important to recognize in both the initial episode of CDI, in which they looked at four RCTs, three of those, are, three of those four RCTs also looked at recurrence, a recurrent episode of CDI and compared cure rates in patients who received fidaxomycin or vancomycin, as well as sustained response. So um, can you just click, please? So what's notable here is that the initial cure rates are actually really similar um, between patients who receive vancomycin and patients who receive fidaxomycin. Where you really see a good benefit is in sustained response. So at four weeks in, who um, kind of goes back and has another relapsing episode of C. diff and who does well? And that's really where you're seeing that benefit from fidaxomycin. And that's sort of important to consider as we're thinking about what to reach for as we're treating our individual patients. Next slide. So I'm going to highlight a couple of those RCTs that I mentioned. So this is kind of the first one, which is Louis et al. Um, published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2011. So this is a phase three clinical trial um, looking at over 600 patients in the U.S. and Canada. Um, as Dr. Rao mentioned, um, IBD is sort of a tricky thing because it's kind of hard to tell, um, you know, ideology of diarrhea in patients with IBD. So those patients are often excluded from studies. Um, they also excluded patients with fulminant disease, as well as patients who had multiple episodes in the last three months. So you could have one, but you couldn't have more than that. And that's something to consider as we're looking at the patients in front of us. Um, and what you see here is what I demonstrated what I demonstrated in the prior slide, which is that clinical cure rates were very similar between vink and um, fidaxomycin, but recurrence rates were um, improved in patients who um, were treated with fidaxomycin. One other result that's um, important to note and kind of something to think about is that fidaxomycin seems more effective than vancomycin in non-hypervirulent strains. So if you're in a health system that ribotypes their um, C. diff, it might be something to consider consider that depending on what strains are sort of dominant, um, it's something to kind of think about in terms of which drug you want to pull from. Next slide. So Cornerly et al. Uh, publishes their paper the following year. Um, they include um, participants from Europe in addition to Canada and the U.S. Again, another RCT where they're looking at um, PO vancomycin versus fidaxomycin, both at initial episode as well as at recurrence. Exclusion criteria are pretty similar. Um, and another result of interest, the reason that I'm highlighting this study, is that exposure to other antibiotics reduced clinical cure rates in the vanc group, but not the fidaxomycin group, which means that if you have a patient who you know, you know has recurrent infection, ha is going to require antibiotics in the future, then um, perhaps they may get a little bit more benefit from the fidaxomycin when you're kind of on the fence. Next slide. 
So I think the big um, elephant in the room or the thing that everybody always considers when they're looking at these guidelines is cost consideration. So um, this is just uh, on a quick Google on GoRx. Um, fidaxomycin is $4,400 for a 10 day supply. Um, and vincomycin is south of $80. Um, and so that's 55 times more expensive. And I think that's something that we need to be mindful of. Um, I will note that there are patient assistance programs that um, Merck and others use, um, and that's something that you should definitely be considering if you're considering starting your patients on this and the patient does not have active insurance. Next slide. So, you know, you kind of saw the the relative differences in, in recurrence. And so I think it creates this question of, you know, IDSA is making these pretty strong recommendations that the preferred agent should be fedoxamycin with vancomycin being the alternative in both um, the initial episode of C. diff as well as in the first recurrence. Um, and I and I appreciated that um, IDSA kind of did a good job of kind of citing their sources here. So um, there are several studies that have done cost effectiveness um, modeling um, and looking at relative benefits of FIDAX versus vancomycin. Um, as Dr. Rao mentioned, um, a case of C. diff can, cause, can cost up to 34K. Um, and so, you know, when you're looking at preventing recurrence, that's something to consider, even if you're thinking about having an initially expensive drug up front. Um, and I appreciated this quote in the guidelines, which says that the panel agrees that the cost effectiveness analysis probably favors the use of fidoxamycin over vancomycin in patients with an initial episode of CDI due to its greater effectiveness with respect to sustained clinical response, but acknowledges that implementing this recommendation probably reduces equity due to variation in medical insurance coverage. And I think it's always important to think about how we are providing equitable care and how our recommendations affect equity. So I just was very appreciative that they put that in there. But it's definitely something that when we are seeing patients in the hospital or seeing patients in the clinic that we should be thinking about as well. Next slide. So talked a little bit about fedaxomycin. The other um, therapy that was mentioned in the guidelines that um, some people on this call may be a little bit less familiar with is bezotuximab. So what is this? This is a monoclonal antibody specifically against um, C. diff toxin B. Um, it's given as a single course, uh, a single dose, I'm sorry, during the course of standard of care antibiotics. Data from the for the use of this comes from the MODIFY studies, so the MODIFY studies actually looked at both toxin A and toxin B monoclonal antibodies, and um, Beslo came up on top. The toxin A antibody was found to be less effective. Um, and they looked at patients who both had um, recurrent CDI and primary CDI, and there were lower rates of recurrence amongst patients who received bezlotuximab compared to placebo. And that's where the recommendation for the use of bezlotuximab comes from. Next slide. Um, because this is all over the guidelines, I just thought it would be remiss if I didn't mention this. Um, so the FDA does warn that um, in patients with CHF, congestive heart failure, bezlotuximab should be reserved for the use um, where benefits outweigh the risks. And they um, they quote this ad hoc analysis that looked at rates of um, heart failure in patients who received bezlotuximab. And there does seem to be um, some trend towards um, higher risk of heart failure and mortality in those groups. So just something to kind of think about um, and kind of weigh your options in terms of other therapies you might be providing these patients. Next slide. Um, I'm going to quickly make a note about um, C. diff and socioeconomic status. This is kind of a, a burgeoning area of research right now um, in the C. diff field and um, something that I'm excited to see where the data goes uh, moving forward. Um, next slide. Next slide, please. So the data for this kind of comes from... Um, two major studies and then a third study that I'm going to talk about here at the end. So um, the Emerging Infections Program is a laboratory-based surveillance kind of run out of the CDC with multiple sites. And um, the New Mexico site specifically um, noted that patients um, were seemed to have some trend towards higher rates of community-acquired C. diff in areas of lower socioeconomic status. So um, this was a particularly interesting finding as we see rates of community acquired C. diff increasing in our in, in society. So at present, approximately 
uh, 32% of patients um, with CDI have community acquired CDI. They don't have a lot of um, hospital um, touch points or anything like that. And they sort of are acquiring C. diff in the community. And this is sort of the population that's of particular interest when we're looking at socioeconomic status and CDI. So patients with community acquired C. diff are more likely to be younger, more likely to be women, have fewer comorbidities and have less severe infections. Um, and this is the particular group that um, our, study our studies were looking at. Um, they noted that patients were more likely to have community acquired um, CDI if they lived in census tracts with a higher percentage of uninsured patients, um, this was possibly due to the increased use of emergency services in their in healthcare. So rather than going to a PCP's office for routine care, some of these patients may be utilizing emergency services, which have higher rates of C. diff on touch surfaces there. Um, overcrowding in the home, they noted that patients who have 1.5 or more people per room um, were more likely to have community acquired C. diff, and that kind of makes sense. Um, lower income and lower educational attainment also were found to be statistically significant in their model. Um, and so that's something that we need to kind of be thinking about. And this is initial CDF, this isn't recurrent CDF, but um, on, you know, this is the population that's more likely, I think, to, to have community acquired CDF. Um, Another study looked at how patients do after they leave the hospital. So say that a patient um, has C. diff in the hospital, they're discharged. Patients from a lower socioeconomic um, status, um, also known in this study, was kind of measured by disadvantaged neighborhood. Um, were more likely to be readmitted following CDI. Now, the study was not powered to look at whether they were um, readmitted for recurrent CEDA for other reasons, but um, these are patients that might be a little bit more vulnerable to hospital readmission and maybe somebody that we should be following up on a little bit more um, closely after they leave the hospital after having CEDA. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maida. Our third presenter is Colleen Kraft. Dr. Kraft is the Associate Chief Medical Officer of Emory University Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia. She splits her time between hospital leadership, clinical research, clinical care of inpatients, and teaching. She is a professor in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine and the Department of Medicine Division of Infectious Diseases. She is the president of the American Society for Microbiology beginning in July 2021, Dr. Kraft is trained and board certified in internal medicine, infectious diseases, and medical microbiology. She co-founded the Emory Microbiota Enrichment Program with Dr. Tanvi Dahir in 2012. Since then, Dr. Kraft has been committed to the use of microbiome therapeutics for the treatment of C. difficile infection. Dr. Kraft? Thank you so much, Diane. So I wanted to wrap up um, these two fantastic talks with just talking about the future of C. difficile treatment, which I really believe is here. I think we've gained so much knowledge over the last decade that I think we're in a very exciting time for treating our patients. Um, I do want to uh, disclose that I consult for rebiotics and fairing, as well as for serious therapeutics. And I kept this... Um, uh, I always talk about the gut being like a garden. And when I was uh, looking for that phrase on Google uh, this morning, uh, I found that there's a kid's book about it. So of course I've already ordered it, um, but I do believe that our gut is like a garden and it's a lot about how we tend it um, before we get C. diff, after we get C. diff and during C. diff. And so we'll, I'll try to bring together what you've learned already um, for, for, those, for that information. Next slide, please. So I think um, one of the things that's been really exciting is that the understanding of, of the gut microbiome has really allowed us to be proactive in treatment. You've already heard about this um, from both Dr. Rao and Dr. Mehta. Um, we have um, better and clearer um, directives on which antibiotic therapeutics we should use to treat C. diff. Um, the the um, moving of fidaxomycin up to a first line agent, uh, it really has to do with less disruption of the gut microbiome, which um, there's actually a question that, that I answered in text just about this is likely um, due to the fact that we think that the less disruption that you have on that gut microbiome while you're treating C. diff, um, that you may um, be able to keep people from getting into recurrent C. diff. <clears throat> 
Um, we do know that recurrent or refractory C. diff um, occurs after the um, dis gut disruption, and it leads really to serious morbid morbidity. And if you haven't known anybody that's had recurrent C. difficile infection, um, you're very lucky. It can be a very um, life-altering event, and we're, we'll meet somebody today that has had something like that. Um, and then uh, I think one of the things that Dr. Mehta already mentioned is we've been focusing a lot on the restoring of the gut microbiome after uh, infection. Next slide. And I think uh, this is another one of the questions about what we tell our patients. So I'll try to answer this live. Um, so our continued study of the gut microbiome, which I want to just um, remind us, I think is really important, and um, I hope funding will continue to do so, is to think about all the aspects of, of the gut before, um, so dietary and lifestyle aspects to sustain a healthy gut microbiome. Um, you, you know, one of the things that Dr. Rao talked about was that colonization resistance. Um, I think, again, this is a, another question in the text, how to have continued um, efforts at minimizing unnecessary use of antibiotics. So all of the patients that I've seen for recurrent C. diff that may have gotten fecal transplant, they are their own best advocates against getting different, uh, against either not getting antibiotics or really waiting to see if they need antibiotics um, because they don't want to go back into their cycle of recurrent C. diff. Um, I think our guidelines uh, drive the care of patients from the physician and nurse practitioner, uh, advanced practice practitioner side to, for less um, progression, because if we're following those guidelines in theory, the, the use of those guidelines will lead to better outcomes. And then I think um, early recognition uh, of recurrent C. difficile as a real problem has, has really come to light um, with the advent of the more frequent use of fecal transplant. Next slide. This slide looks a little bit like a jungle, but I was trying to kind of get the gut garden feel um, for you. So I think some of the bacterial principles that are thought to be important, and I'm going to tell you that a lot of these are not, uh, are still being studied, probably still need a lot of study, but it has to do with, with what we feed that gut microbiome, what the microbiome contains, which would be like probiotics. Um, so uh, in a sense, our fecal transplant and some of those other therapeutics have to do with putting in microorganisms in to the body that we hope are beneficial or that are beneficial. And then I think one of the areas that's going to be interesting if you want to think about what to look for if you're a patient or a provider um, or a colleague um, to look for down, down the line is I think there's a lot of study and interest in postbiotics is one way to put it. So these are the byproducts of bacteria that are beneficial. So this might end up being another area where we can target therapeutics uh, for C. difficile that's very exciting. Next, next slide. So really in conclusion, I think thinking about um, restoring that gut microbiome. Um, uh, so some of the future preparations that you, you will be seeing, fecal microbiota transplant, while it's been used for, um, depending on where you read, maybe hundreds of years, for sure, um, it's, it's increased use in the last decade. Um, it's currently not regulated. And so industry uh, and researchers continue to work towards fecal transplant-like products or substitutes. And I think in general for you as a patient, a colleague, or a, a physician is just to continue to have vigilance and safety on safety and efficacy. Um, and that'll be a very critical piece of how we evaluate our new era of microbiome therapeutics. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kraft. The IDSA Foundation believes in advocating for the patient's voice to help provide the best care possible. Today, we will, heal, we will hear from Lilia Nightingale, who is treated under the care of Dr. Kraft for C. difficile. Lilia, thank you so much for joining us. Hi. Thank you, Diane. I received oh, my experience with C. diff started on September 2nd, 2021. I had um, my second child, normal, easy labor, but I received antibiotics during labor. I left the hospital after a couple of days. And when I went home, I just never really felt well. Um, and I chalked it up to being extremely tired, having just given birth. But on the 24th of September, roughly three weeks after the baby was born, I started experiencing what I thought was a urinary tract infection. So I went to my doctor, she gave me a broad spectrum antibiotic and 
I went home, took that, you know, expected to feel better. That was a Friday. By Monday, I was in so much pain, I couldn't get out of bed. And I went back, she thought the antibiotic might not be working. She gave me another one. And in the meantime, the initial test they had done for the UTI came back negative, but I, she told me to continue taking the antibiotics. So a few days later, I started experiencing diarrhea and I called and they said, oh, it's just the antibiotic. Don't worry about it. Over the next couple of weeks, it just progressively got worse. And the doctor's office told me to take a modium, you know, and then finally they said, okay, you should just go to urgent care. I went to urgent care where they promptly told me I should go to the emergency room. On October 13th, I ended up in the ER and I was diagnosed with a C. diff infection and they gave me a um, vancomycin prescription and sent me home. I had a really hard time getting an appointment with a GI doctor to follow up, but I did. And he oversaw my, my therapy and then, um, you know, explained to me that it was very possible it could recur. So about two weeks after I finished the vancomycin therapy, the infection came back. It was terrible. I felt absolutely hopeless. And he put me on fidaxomycin. I took that for 10 days and it was the exact same thing. I, in the meantime, had visited an, an ID doctor who had told me that if it continued to recur, there's a possibility I would just need to be on antibiotics and kind of taper for the remainder of my lifetime. In all of this, I basically did not see my children. We, in addition to the baby, had a three-year-old or have a three-year-old and I pretty much lived in the bathroom of the room I share with my husband. It, it was terrible. And I began to feel as though I would probably die. I lost about 15 pounds in the course of it all. And with the third relapse, um, I, I truly did not think I would make it. And I just was, you know, unsure of what to do. So I ended up finding Dr. Kraft's name through my own research online with the um, Peggy Lills Foundation. And I emailed Dr. Kraft, truly a minute later, she emailed me back and I had a transplant scheduled for the next week. When I went in, I was nervous. I wasn't sure what to expect, but it was truly, a, I, it's hard to say this describing an enema, but a pleasant experience. I, my mom took me, my husband was with the children and I received the enema, just chatted with my mom for an hour while lying in the bed and went home. And over the next two weeks, she had warned me that, you know, I might have a little bit of diarrhea here and there, and it did kind of ebb and flow, but um, it was remarkable. I was able to enjoy Christmas with my family. I made a point after the fact of avoiding common irritants to the gut, like, you know, gluten and lactose. I didn't you know, have alcohol. I was very careful in what I ate and I continue to be that way, though I am now able to pretty much eat what I want. But I, I feel like that without the fecal transplant, I surely would have died. And I cannot thank Dr. Kraft enough for what she did. And it was really just such a, an easy experience compared to everything else. And um, I, I really appreciate it and had a great experience. So thank you. Back to you, Diane. Lilia, thank you so much for sharing your patient journey with us. Thank you to Drs. Rao, Meta, and Kraft for your insightful presentations. If you haven't already done so, please enter your questions using the Q&A button. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Kraft to facilitate Q&A. Thank you. And I just want to remind everybody um, to look at the Q&A and put, put a question in. If you have one, we have been answering them during this um, uh, webinar. So uh, you can look and see if it's been answered. Uh, I'm going to put one question uh, to uh, Dr. Rao because I wasn't sure if we had different um, uh, 
uh, practices, but um, I wanted to ask uh, about the um, comment on the rise in antibiotic acquired C. diff and what we do clinically uh, educating uh, patient, primary care physicians on antibiotics to avoid when and in whom. Um, yeah, I wasn't sure about uh, if this question was referring to a rise in resistance mutations against the antibiotics used to treat C. difficile, or if it was result uh, from a, you know the antibiotics that lead to C. difficile infection, the ones that disrupt the microbiome that we use for other conditions. Uh, going on the first pathway, I'm not really aware of any compelling data that there's any clinically significant resistance of C. difficile, either to vancomycin or fidaxomycin. Um, and those being our top two choices now, I think um, it's something that I worry very little about clinically, and I don't think there's any um, data suggesting it's something we should be worried about, um, uh, including a recent study that suggested there might be some uh, a high vancomycin resistance in some C. difficile isolates, but I think those ended up probably being C. inoculum and not C. difficile. Um, the other side of the question of the antibodies that lead to C. difficile um, you know, I think uh, there's a lot of effort and, and recognition that some of these antibiotics have uh, unintended side effects and consequences other than just resistance. And C. diff is one of the things that people talk about. And I know at our center, we have gone through and changed a lot of our institutional guidelines about how we approach, you know, standard of care, empiric treatment regimens for pneumonia and gastrointestinal infections to use less broad agents in some situations. And I think that's that's helped. We certainly are using a lot less uh, third generation cephalosporins and fluoroquinolones for those conditions, uh, which are more at risk than some of the other agents that we could use. Well, there was also a comment for Lelia. Thank you, Lelia, for sharing your story. It's so important that healthcare authorities and groups working towards prevention treatment understand the journey of people who suffer from C. diff and how we can help to prevent that. So I also um, want to thank Lelia because, she, you know, it's it's one thing to be a patient. And obviously, those of us that treat patients on this call um, find it very rewarding to be able to restore people back to their um, normal uh, li lifestyles. Um, but also, it's brave for Lelia to come out and share her story uh, when she has lots to do with uh, two small children. So thank, thank you. you. Um, all right, I will uh, turn one to Dr. Mehta. Um, see, I saw it and now I have lost it, of course. Um, do you have any data on community acquired C. diff in children or adolescents? Um, and I'm asking Dr. Mehta, given that she's doing some epidemiology work on this and it's okay if the answer is not sure, but I'll get back to you. Um, so my work is exclusively in adults, but um, yeah, I think the the risk factors are actually really similar um, based on my understanding, um, gastric acid produ production suppression. So patients being on PPIs, things like that, immunocompromised children as well. Um, the numbers do start to look more like adult numbers, as you can imagine, as we get into the adolescence. Um, and in our study population, it's a fairly small number of kids. Um, so my study population personally is about 17,000 people. And um, by removing the kids, I think I removed about a thousand of those. So they are the majority adults. Um, but there is obviously a good contingent of children as well. Thank you. Um, there was a specific question for Dr. Rao that I will, um, so uh, can Dr. Rao explain how van uh, prolonged vancomycin actually makes infection worse? Should hospital have only certain rooms for C. difficile patients? Up, oh, you're on mute. Thanks. Just to clarify, the point I was making on the slides um, was that if you have longer courses of vancomycin compared to shorter courses, that is more disruptive to the gut microbiome and allows for a larger niche uh, and, and more persistent niche that C. difficile can take advantage of. Um, because many of the bacteria that would be affected are ones that are related to C. difficile and provide some of that niche exclusion that we think might be important in colonization resistance. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think, um, you know, having uh, uh, vancomycin on board, uh, we don't fully understand mechanistically why it seems to increase the, the rate of shedding uh, post uh, C. difficile infection, but that does seem to be the case. Um, so I'm not sure if that was the question just to clarify that or if they, it was any further, but um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, another one for Lelia. Thank you, Lelia. Your experience is so important for us to hear. It reminds us that clinicians must work to get the best treatment for their patients. 
Um, for there were two questions that uh, were regards to using intravenous metronidazole for critically ill patients or other um, recommendations for critically ill patients. I sent you um, a recent review, um, and I sent it the one that I we, we authored, but that's because I knew where it was quickly. So you can use it and find others. Don't just think it's about me, but I put those two references for those two questions. Um, I think IV metronidazole for someone that's fulminantly ill is absolutely the right thing to do. Um, and um, we put a number of other things such as, um, uh, you know, working on, um, you know, rectal, uh, uh, administration of vancomycin if individuals have um, an alias uh, and, um, uh, you know, kind of involving surgeons early to do something maybe non-invasive sooner or less invasive sooner rather than waiting till um, you need a, ful a fulminant colectomy. So that was two of the questions. Um, oh, this is a very interesting one from Nina. After a recurrence of C. difficile, how long do you think it will take for the microbiome to restore itself if there are no aggravating factors? This is a great, um, uh, great publication uh, by Death Lefson. It can't actually be replicated anymore because it wouldn't get IRB approval. They gave healthy volunteers um, a dose, or I think one set or two sets of ciprofloxacin, and it took about six months for them to get back to the depth and breadth of their microbiome. Um, before the dose of ciprofloxacin. So that's a pretty strong drug to get in as an outpatient. However, um, that actually, that slide and that information is what started me into this work uh, in 2012. I was so impressed by the fact that if somebody who is normal gets um, uh, ciprofloxacin and it takes that long to restore, what must the patients that I'm giving them for severe infections or different things, what must their gut microbiome look, look like? Um, so Sorry, it's just one of my favorite favorite topics. Um, and for the individuals um, who's asking about fecal transplant screening before or after administration, I think Dr. Mehta is working on putting a reference for that. Um, Tony, I'm not ignoring you, but the C. diff shedding duration for patients receiving fidaxomycin treatment. Dr. Rao, if you know, I'm gonna let you answer, but I do not actually know. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I can hypothesize it. It would be shorter with fidaxomycin than with vancomycin, for for example. There's some data about how fidaxomycin actually seems to associate physically with spores, um, and may actually be right there, ready to uh, you know affect the antimicrobial effect when the spores germinate. Uh, but I don't know that anyone actually has data about this. So. All right, and there is actually a question for um, um, Mrs. Nightingale. Uh, thank you for sharing your story. Having experienced multiple recurrences with medical therapy for C. diff, would you consider receiving a fecal transplant via enema as a first option therapy if it had been offered? Oh, 100%. When I went through the varying rounds of antibiotics, I just felt so in, in just a total state of despair. I mean, it was just, you know, constant like monitoring to make sure I took them. And I, you know, had a very hard time getting information on C. diff um, from the doctors. And frankly, until I met Dr. Kraft, finding a doctor who really had much knowledge about how to treat it. But um, when the doctor told me that I might need to take, you know, vancomycin for the remainder of my lifetime, I kind of thought, well, what is the point then? It's, you know, why <laughs> would you want to do that? Um, because I found that, you know, both of the antibiotics were hard on my system too. And um, the fecal transplant, I mean, I, this is, you know, kind of a funny thing, but when my mom took me home, I, we needed a few things at the house and I felt well enough after the transplant to go to Target that afternoon. Um, so it, you know, I had to be careful and do my part to eat right, but small price to pay. So a hundred percent. Thank you. And thank you to everybody for um, what it was a very, I mean, we answered 21 questions and we still have a few others that would take uh, longer than we have to answer. So thank you so much for the interest. And I know this, all this, I speak for the speakers that we are very excited to bring this information to you. And we thanks the IDSA Foundation for that, for our invitations.
Great. Thank you, Dr. Kraft. I want to take this time to say thank you to our audience for attending today's program, sponsored by our industry partners, Immune Therapeutics and Serious Therapeutics. We hope you've benefited from this valuable information. Thank you again to all of our speakers. If you're interested in listening again or want to share this webinar, the recorded session for today's webcast will be available on our website in two to three business days at IDSA idsafoundation.org front slash your hyphen health. On November 18th, we will honor Worldwide Antibiotic Awareness Week with a webinar entitled Gram Negative Resistance Hiding in Plain Sight starting at 1 p.m. As we continue with C. diff Awareness Month, we'll host one more webinar entitled The Microbiome and C. diff, Can the Gut Defend Against Infection? The link to register for both webinars is in the chat. We hope you'll join us. Thanks again to everyone. Have a wonderful week.